Um, I'm going to be speaking today about private um, document passing using some open source models. So a lot of people can't send their data to OpenAI for privacy reasons, whatever it might be. And um, well, you have to do something else if you can't use them. So I'm going to be talking about that. So I'm one of the co-founders of Mystic AI. Um, we originally started as a hardware company, um, but now we're very much on the software end of infrastructure for machine learning. So we're a YC alumni. We did uh, YC in the winter 21 batch, raised 5.4 million now, um, kind of just before the Series A stage at the moment, about to do that. And yeah, been going since 2019. We're on about the third version of our infra to automate the running and deploying of your models uh, privately in the cloud. So I'm going to get on to now more of the interesting LLM stuff here. So. Uh, I don't know where a lot of you work, obviously, but in many companies, they've completely barred the use of OpenAI, regardless of whether it's logical or not. So loads of people are using ChatGPT for many various things, um, but a lot of companies are really concerned about data privacy. So if you pass confidential documents in there, OpenAI has said that they're not going to use it in training data, but again, logically or illogically, people still don't really trust that. Um, given that much of their data now is very clearly uh, used from many companies and you can do extract some data from the training set there. So if you want to do private document searching, uh, QA and understand uh, any form of confidential document, you do need something that is privately hosted using an open source LLM. Now, you're not going to do that internally um, or create the model at least. It costs a lot of money to train and experts. That's why there's only a few companies in the world that have the capabilities to do this. So the question then becomes, well, what are you going to do? Open source models are getting much, much better, as uh, today has shown, um, but they are still quite tricky to actually run in production. So Falcon 40B, it was made in the UAE, I believe. Um, it's a really, really, really big model. Um, it's very expensive to run. So Falcon 40B, uh, the full original weights of it, they're in floating point 32, uh, requires 169 gigabytes of video memory on GPUs. What that basically means is it costs 16 grand a month to run on one server just to run the model. So if you're prototyping something internally in your company, that's a hell of a lot of money just for a POC. And then imagine you have a lot of traffic going to it, um, then you need a lot more servers or it starts to become unusable. So costs just become exponentially large as time goes along. Recently, um, I didn't include it in here, but some of the uh, metrics of running GPT-4 got released as well, got kind of leaked. It requires an outrageous amount of GPUs to run that is just not reasonable. So a lot of people said to us, well, we can just get a private deployment on Azure of uh, GPT-4, ChatGPT. It's so much money, uh, substantially more than 20 grand a month, that's for sure. So actually trying to find out how to run these things is still very challenging. Um, you can reduce the model quality through something called quantization. It basically means you reduce the resolution of the numbers you use for each of those 40 billion parameters. Some downsides of that is it actually ironically becomes quite a bit slower to run a lot of the time. Um, and you require some expertise to do it. It degrades quality, a few other things, but it does reduce the operational costs. So you can reduce the cost of running the half precision version um, by just yeah, running it on fewer GPUs, essentially, uh, by reducing um, the size. So Hugging Face um, has a leaderboard shown here on the right um, that gets updated. Well, uh, needs to be updated now, uh, but it gets updated really regularly with the leaderboard of all of the open source LLMs in the world. So I'm going to be going through an embedding model here today as well, um, but you can always be up to date there with what the best one is to actually try and how large they are. So you can see on the leaderboard, most of them are kind of 30 billion parameters or above if they're kind of top 10. So one thing I hate doing in my job, I'm one of the founders. Um, I do all of our fundraising, finances, a lot of recruitment, things like that. I really hate working with emails. So I wanted to come up with a project that would allow me to analyze some very private data that I definitely didn't want going through to OpenAI um, on a privately hosted system using some of these models. So I wanted a tool that would ingest all of my emails and then allow me to have a chat interface or a query answer system 
where I could ask an LLM questions about my emails without having to train it or anything like that. And then it gave me a reasonable, parcelable uh, response. So the initial approach to doing this, I'm going to be speaking about um, a couple of like famous libraries that are all the rage right now. The initial kind of primitive approach to doing this is hook up to the Gmail API. I use uh, G Suite for all my work email. Um, so hook up to there, download my emails, use two libraries, uh, Llama Index and Langchain, very popular at the moment. So if you know anything about uh, vector DBs, that's basically what Llama Index does. Langchain provides an easy interface to do lots of chained complicated things on LLMs. Um, but you can also configure it to run privately. So out of the box, both of those things require you to have your OpenAI uh, token available, and it will send a load of requests out there. Now that is the problem. So you need to redirect it to a privately hosted model. So initially, I wanted to run Falcon 7B. I showed before how expensive it was to run the big boy version of it. Um, and then there's E5 Large V2. So there's another leaderboard that's just for embedding text. Now, uh, I'll go into a bit of information later on what embedding is. It basically means take an email or a bunch of text into a series of numbers that you can compare to another series of numbers and see how similar they are. So it just converts your text into numbers that represent whatever that is in that text. Then um, you can use the query feature in Llama Index to basically do the rest. So Llama Index handles uh, like loads of those different vectors. So I can pass in a thousand emails and it will make it really easy to search throughout there, provide some nice interfaces. Uh, make it pretty with Gradio, step number four. Gradio is a way to prototype uh, and do basic MVP front ends for something. Um, I'll be showing some screenshots later and then never look at emails again. So I'll show you like actually what it looks like setting something like that up. Now the full kind of context of that is Imagine you're a consultant and you have loads of different projects that you work on. We see a lot of people want to ingest all of the documents from those different projects and then make it searchable. Say you have a new person jump on that project, they want to be able to see what did we do under this situation or what about this and then get all of that back. So that's kind of like the full grander scope of this, but again, just on my emails. So, LAM index again uses vector DBs to store embeddings for later comparison and usage. Um, out of the box, it does require OpenAI, as I said. Um, so the typical way I'm going to go through this on like my attempt v1 to get this to work. It's not great, and then v2 is better. Um, so download everything over the API. Do some filtering on my email. So if you have a look at like the raw emails, there's a lot of junk in there. Um, emails are just HTML, how a web page renders. So you've got to do a bit of filtering, uh, do the embedding process, and then store it in Llama Index. So the way vector DBs work is they get all of those vectors that I discussed before, and then they create something called an index. So Llama Index comes from that. But it basically just maps out all of the things that you've vectorized. Um, Redis is a really common um, in-memory database that's used to handle a lot of this. It's been around in enterprise for a really long time. Um, but there are like two math functions that are used to see how similar vectors are. So there's something called cosine similarity, um, which is the top one up there, and then something called L2 norm. Both of these things are used in traditional machine learning as well, actually. Um, but they just show how close two vectors are. I'm not going to linger on too much here, but just for some information. So I really, really, really like Redis. Um, we use it in many other areas of our system, but it's incredibly fast. So when you're running millions of documents, you need an incredibly fast backend to actually handle all of that compute. So when you have a query that comes in, uh, a vector for something you want to do now, and find any documents that relate to it, it will run that, those uh, math functions I showed you before over millions of documents. So you do need a really good setup pretty much out of the box to actually run that in any decent system. Do not do it yourself. Um, some people do try to. Llama Index has um, not a great system for doing it uh, on your local system. So I really recommend going down this DB route. Um, and a lot of it's really out of the box. So I definitely recommend that. So initially, when I set the system up, um, you can see here some of the actual responses. So there were some big problems with this. Um, it did work in the sense it returned something, but it was absolute trash. So 
The initial reason uh, that I looked into you there was my input query, the embedding really struggled to match any emails that were actually relevant. So if I said uh, we use GCP for a lot, Google Cloud, sorry, Amazon, uh, we use AWS as well. Um, but if I was to say, show me emails from Google, it would show me really random stuff that just was not relevant. So it wouldn't know if it was from Google, it would just have Google in the body for whatever reason. So we're an info provider. So the word Google or Amazon comes up a lot in emails that we send. So it needs a bit more context, right? So that was the first problem. Also, Falcon 7B is kind of trash. It's a really small model compared to the much more expensive one that I spoke about before. So at the final stage of uh, generating the response here, so uh, the way that this process works is it finds all of the relevant emails and then constructs a really large prompt that gets fed into the LLM. And it says, here's some context. Here are some emails that we think are relevant. Now answer this question and then it will hopefully answer. So you can see here in the response, it answered correctly. Um, my query was, uh, how much did DigitalOcean charge me? It said $74.40, that was correct. But then it included a bunch of other random stuff there. So this is potluck, whether it works or not, and often it just returns complete garbage. So there, that's where like the quality of the LLM does actually matter substantially. So if you have to do a lot of pre-processing in that prompt, a lot of prompt engineering, uh, it's just really not great. So to tackle the first problem, I went into some of the embedding. So I, I found out some really interesting things that surprised me quite a lot, actually. So I had uh, a series of emails that I had taken and then compared them just to the query, just to see actually how close the similarity was. So what I found was uh, the, the main query was um, who has agreed to have a meeting with me next week. That was the base query. So it needs to understand the concept of agree, a meeting, and next week. So there are some complicated somewhat things in there. So it managed to match a lot of the queries reasonably well, but I then included an anti-email. In this situation, it was someone who rejected a meeting with me. So what I saw was it was seeing the word meeting and therefore saying they were very closely related. It didn't really understand what was going in there. And what that meant was I had to do some further processing with those emails to actually make them somewhat usable in a vector DB. Now, um, I don't know if any of you are data scientists or work with them, but one of the biggest things people spend time on is data processing. So you can't just throw stuff at an LLM and hope for the best you will not get great quality out of the box. You do have to do some of these checks to ensure it's gonna be relatively accurate. So I had some basic emails that were a simple agreement, a really random email that was unrelated to a meeting, uh, an ideal email that was a very clear, yes, I want to have a meeting next week, and then an anti-email which rejected a meeting. What I found was that if I actually passed the email through the LLM before and summarized it, so reduced the amount of text to be embedded, it then drastically increased the quality of these matching pairs. So um, on the right hand side here, <clears throat> pardon my voice, if you see the red and orange bars, in those situations, I've summarized the email and then compared them to my query. The green dotted line is just random text, random characters that I've matched against my query. So that's a datum basically, just a baseline level. If it's lower than that, it's far away. If it's higher than that, it's a closer match. So I found passing all of the emails through there substantially better at improving performance. So I then completely changed the whole system to actually incorporate that uh, a dash bit more prompt engineering, and then it started to work really well. So here, please, oh wait, no, this is recorded. I'm sure it's fine. Um, but here are some of my emails that I received um, and my email as well. So um, it then started to really reliably actually return reasonable things. One thing I did change here was running on Falcon 40B, which I forgot to mention as well. Um, the email summarization though had a substantial impact, but Falcon 40B definitely had a big impact as well. So this stuff is really hard to run from a model perspective. Um, again, Llama Index uh, and Langchain just run out of the box with OpenAI but it's the actual stuff behind the scenes there that is really challenging. So um, I just modified the version I used and the number of GPUs on the cluster with our uh, solution, which is part of the reason why I'm here as well. 
Um, and it just kind of worked out of the box, which is great. So you can see here a couple of basic examples I have. I'm not going to run this live because, again, it's hooked up to my private email. Um, and I receive things uh, that I cannot share on there from investors. So um, yes, it works really, really well with this. Now, if you're running this on any arbitrary data set, it will perform at a similar level. Um, but you do have to do some really specific prompt engineering for your application. So for me, I said, I am, uh, you are an email answering bot for Paul Hetherington, my name, um, answer him accordingly. So if I put in uh, me, for example, it needs to know who me is. So that's relevant information. And also I had to say, you are an email answering chatbot, and then give in examples of emails and responses in that original prompt. So that guides it to a really specific application that does matter a lot. So if you're in a consulting environment, you'd say you're a consulting answering bot, answering questions on historical projects um, for X person. And then you can go from there. So as I said, the hard part is actually getting the models to run. So I did that full project two weeks ago on a Sunday afternoon. And it's because most of this stuff is ready out of the box from a software integration perspective. But it's the actual running of the models that is challenging, which is what we do. So um, to actually get the cluster to run this setup, it requires um, some of the, well now, second generation um, NVIDIA A100 80 gigabytes. They cost a lot of money to run. Um, on our enterprise offering, we run them on spot instances and a whole host of other things. Do a bunch of model sharing where I could run both E5 large and the large Falcon models actually on the same graphics card um, straight out of the box, which is great. So all of these models to go from nothing to have a full private hosted version of them on GCP AWS, for example, um, takes at least under, uh, under 30 minutes. So it's incredibly fast. And then it's all fully secure and very private. I don't know how much time I have. So I'm going to share some very short uh, kind of opinions on some of those things, and then I'm all done. So um, I think Langchain and Llama Index are good, um, but you should probably do it yourself for real production grade usage. Um, and yeah, it's quite hacky to change things around in it. So I do software engineering, so I knew how to change things. But for a standard data scientist, it's just like, it's not quite there yet. Uh, for instance, when I had to summarize emails before them being vectorized, I had to change quite a bit to actually get that process done. Uh, Redis is really good. You should definitely check that out as well. Um, and you should be really focused on what you do with LLMs as well. Don't just throw absolutely everything at them you will spend a lot of time just trying to get things to work and not really get any real results in return. Um, and hosting models is really hard. If you are an enterprise company, uh, reach out and we can do it very quickly. And yeah, thank you very much.